Good afternoon, everyone. Allison Skaberg here with Consolidated Planning Group. We are happy to be back with you today. Today we are um, talking about the key steps to transition success, and we have uh, partnered with April Martin again with Workforce Solutions. Um, so today we are in webinar mode, and that means that we can't see you or hear you, um, but we do know you're here, and we're glad that you're here and that you've joined us today. We're going for an hour, so if you're planning your um, time today, we will be done uh, within an hour. And um, everybody that is um, listening in today is going to get a copy of today's slides and a link to the recording so you can go back and listen to it uh, later. All of our past webinars live on the Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel. Uh, Consolidated Planning Group um, is a holistic special needs financial planning firm partnering with families just like you um, to ensure future success for your loved one with a disability. Um, having said that, we're going to kick off uh, today with April, and April is going to talk to us a little bit more about the programs that she's involved with and how you might be able to get your loved one involved with some of these programs as well. We invite everyone to put your questions in the chat box today. We're going to be monitoring that chat box. We're going to get to just as many questions as we can. So having said that, April, um, I'd love to turn it over to you. Well, thank you for partnering with me, Allison. I know you guys always have lots of great information for families. I work at Workforce Solutions as a hireability navigator. And what that means is I act kind of like a Lego connector to connect people with resources in the community and through vocational rehabilitation services from the Texas Workforce Commission. So if you'd like to see webinars that I've partnered with Allison on or I have some others, you can visit our website here by clicking the QR code. Allison, when you go to the next slide. Um, my next webinar is with Allison, and we're going to be talking about transition tips. And I look forward to that. Those are always really good webinars. Allison has lots of great information that's going to be on October 2nd. We'll go ahead and move to the next slide. All right, so vocational rehabilitation and workforce offices. So vocational rehabilitation, if you don't know what it is, are services that are designed for adults. And we have a special youth program for youth age 14 to 22 to be able to obtain, maintain, or even upskill the work that you have if you have a disability or a barrier. And most vocational rehabilitation offices are what are called co-located with the Workforce Solutions Office. So that's why I give both QR codes so that you can make sure if you want to visit your local VR office and initiate services that you are able to find it. We can go ahead and go. Um, April, sometimes there's confusion on um, what Workforce Solutions does and what VR um, does. And one of the distinguishing factors that I think about is um, Workforce Solution, um, some of the programs, Summer Earn and Learn, um, the Pre-Employment Training Services, those are two programs that are pretty awesome. And one thing that you said um, that is kind of, you know, outside of our thought process, because we think, you know, at 16 they can work, but the cool thing is, is that these programs can start as early as 14. So if we're trying to work on closing the gaps on impediments to employments with our loved one with a disability, we can start these training programs early. And I think the other thing that sometimes is missed for families that have not gotten involved um, with your organization, VR or Workforce Solutions just yet, is that these programs are state and federally funded that they're you know they are funded and so these are programs that you can get your um, loved one involved with and not have you know big out-of-pocket expenses and things like that um you know tied to them so i love that so much well i really like the fact i'll just add to that briefly is that if you start age 14 you're not in a panic by the senior year and I do advise families, don't wait till the senior year, but if you do and you have a loved one right now that are in their senior year of high school, enroll before their second semester. Because oftentimes what will happen is they will be put on an adult caseload versus a student caseload. And you get a little bit more handholding with the student caseload. 
And you also have a continuous partner because if your student decides to go on to college or anything post-secondary, a lot of the times that counselor will be able to retain that student and you'll be able to work with one person. So those programs for students are 14 to 22 if they're going on for post-secondary education. And so. just so for parents to know that most schools, even private schools, most schools have a VR counselor assigned to the school. So you can check in with the guidance um, office um, or this, you know, the the whatever you know classes your student are in, the, the guidance counselors and um, special needs educators, they know who the guidance counselor is, I mean, who the VR counselor is for your school. Yes, and if you happen to be in our area, Grayson Cook or Fannin, this year I've set up wakelets, so I have virtual counselor packets that are ready to hand out to anybody that needs them. Um, and as far as contacting your local VR office, there are several ways that you can make an appointment. You can actually walk in the door, which is why I gave that map, and just meet with a counselor of the day. And even if they are not a student counselor, they can go ahead and enroll your student and get them started in the process before they're assigned to their actual VR counselor. And I always say, you know, go ahead and keep all of your information, keep a good calendar of who you've contacted, how you've contacted them. That just makes your process a bit easier. You can contact the statewide office through a phone number, or you can do uh, Start My VR Online, or you can even email TWC, the location on the bottom. Okay, go on. At your workforce centers, there are lots of things to help you find a job. Even for students, you can come in, they can talk with an employment specialist, they can have their resume looked at, and if they haven't built one, they can get assistance building it. And then they can also print the resumes. We'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. There are tons of services offered at every workforce solutions office. I won't go into detail with all of these. I just put this slide in so people have a quick reference of some of the things that each Workforce Solutions Office does. And we'll go into the next slide. I do want to bring up the target occupation list. This is not something that people usually know about. Every area has a different target occupation list. And if your student is going to qualify for vocational rehabilitation services and they pick something on the target occupation list, they can dual qualify for programs. And some people say, but my students are already going to receive some help from vocational rehabilitation services with their tuition assistance or any other thing they're going to get. But once you start kind of double dipping, so to say, you're able to receive that much more assistance. Sometimes what that can boil down to is maybe your student was only going to have part of their tuition covered and it could end up that they could get their full amount of their tuition covered plus supplies like books or um, special things that they're going to need to perform an occupation. So I do like to point that out. Whenever you're at a workforce solutions, ask for everything that you can qualify because you may qualify for more than one thing. And I think that's a really cool part is that there is to, um, tuition assistance in these programs if it's in line um, with the work plan and what they need um, to get certified or what they need to do um, to go into one of these vocations. So that is an exciting uh, piece that can be included. I love that. Okay. And um, just in case you don't know where your workforce center is, they are available throughout the nation. A lot of people don't know that. These programs are not relegated to Texas only. They're throughout the U.S., but if you want to find your Texas workforce location and you're not in my area, Grayson Cook or Fannin, you can use this to locate your office. And then we can move. There's, there's a question. I know it's kind of a loaded question. Is it based off of um, family income? And I personally know that there are some income limits and it doesn't mean that they won't work with your student, but there might be some cost share involved for high wage earning families. And it's a complicated calculation that we probably couldn't get into on this webinar, but um, but it is not just for the indigent and there, but there could be some cost share if you're a high wa wage earning family. Is that correct? That is correct. And I will say it is always worth applying 
because the pre-ETS services usually are no cost out of pocket. Um, and pre-ETS is pre-employment training services. And what that can boil down to is uh, paid work experience or a volunteer experience where a student can gain some skills, uh, job exploration, and then also exploration for where would you get the education to do that job, advocacy training. Uh, so those are just a few of the things that you can get. And furthermore, a lot of families oftentimes will be surprised to find out that they actually do qualify for more help than they thought they would. So I would really encourage families to apply and find out what happens. I just wanted to mention that we have entire webinars dedicated um, to Texas Workforce Solutions and vocational rehab. And I also just wanted to mention that awesome summer earn and learn program. I know that we're not in summer right now, um, but it's important for you to know about the summer earn and learn program and get signed up early because I think the cutoff for summer earn and learn is usually around February sometime or the, you know, February or the very beginning of March. So if you're thinking about this in April, you're a day late and a dollar short. So as you're planning that summer earn and learn program is like eight or 10 weeks of employment. And, and it's a good wage, the wage is like established and it depends on your area what the wage is, but on at minimum it's usually 10 bucks an hour I've seen it as much as $16 an hour, depending on the area. Um, so that is a good thing to get involved with. Yes, and as well as the seal we do have the paid work experience, which is year round so some students actually participate in a work experience year round they'll actually work for part of their school day and get paid for it some of the time so someone someone said i don't live in texas is this just for texas so um the we are talking about the texas workforce solutions and workforce commission but as she mentioned vocational rehab and these programs are available all throughout the united states and our transition success um talk that we're going to start in just a moment will be relative uh, to wh whatever state you're in. We serve people all across the United States, and so does this program as well. Yes, if you're in a different state, if you put in your state's name and vocational rehabilitation services, it will usually pop up for you where those are administered from in your state and how to contact them. So I would encourage you to do that. All right. Well, um, if you'd like more information about me or upcoming webinars, you can go to my Padlet and I have lots of transition resources there and all of my contact information as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, you know, this is just a this is a really great program and um and a lot of families, you know, they're, you know, we talk to families and they'll say, my child will never work. And there are families who have kids that will never work. And we understand that. And there are some families that think that it would be challenging. But the whole point of this program is to help close the gap of um, some of the impediments to employment. And in the in initial, when you get started with VR, there's usually some testing involved. Um, it might be a neuropsych testing, learning disability um, testing, and they commonly do a vocational evaluation. This testing is usually covered by the program and not out of pocket to the family. And the vocational evaluation is designed to flush out what those impediments to employment might be. You know, where might they need some help or some training or a coach or, um, or what, you know, what they may need. So I think it's, you know, worth it um, to kind of go through this and check it out. So um, so just to talk a little bit, again, for anybody that's here for the first time, welcome. We are glad you're here. If you've attended our webinars in the past, um, we are certainly glad you're back. Consolidated Planning Group is a holistic special needs financial planning firm. We are nationally certified as Social Security Advisors, members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. We are an advisory and consulting firm um, specifically nuanced and special needs. I am a parent myself to two adult kids uh, with disabilities who have transitioned into a, adulthood. And a lot of our webinars, our YouTube channel, the Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel was simply born out of my own frustration on why is everything so difficult? Everything we touch as parents with kids with disabilities is hard. You know, we have to make sure we dot our I's and cross our T's and say not say the wrong thing. And, you know, it feels 
nerve wracking. And the thing is, is when our kids start high school, you think you have plenty of time and those four years go by. Some of our kids stay in school past four years, you know, to 21 or 22, but it goes by quick. So planning um, and planning for that transition is really, really important because what we don't want to have happen is that these kids come home from school school is over and they have nowhere to go they're not in a transition program they don't have community maybe they're not going to work and so we're trying to see what is next okay and a lot of our kids when it comes to um you know when it comes to planning they may be behind they may be behind their peers from a maturity level they may be behind their peers from an education level and that's okay uh, they really are just where they are and just having a plan and kind of moving into our plan and knowing that our plan is going to change throughout the years as they get to where they're going. So we help people put protection plans in place, lifetime care plans. We do a lot of transition planning. We help open ABLE accounts and we do a lot of advocacy by way of our webinars. And we always just um, want to mention again that your situation is specialized. When you have a loved one with a disability, your situation is specialized. It's important to work with a specialist. So. When it comes to advisors and planning for special needs, fewer than a one tenth of a percent of all financial advisors in the US focus on special needs planning. So the reason it's important to work with a specialist is we want to preserve eligibility for state and federally funded programs and we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. So, and that comes true when it comes to, you know, working with an attorney or working with a planner and I always like to identify the differences of what a planner does and um and what an attorney an attorney does because oftentimes we get calls and people say i want to um, set up a special needs trust i need to establish guardianship um these are things that people may call and ask us for but we actually don't do that we um the the attorneys the estate planning attorneys are um going to be the ones that are going to help with the the special needs trust and the guardianship and the legal documents they're, they're the paper we're the money. We want to make sure that we have money in the right buckets, and we're going to talk about that today. So when it comes to getting started for planning um, for a transition, one of the things that we like to talk about, we have a webinar on this whole topic, um, is uh, developing a letter of intent. And in fact, um, it's your lucky day. We have a letter of intent template that we intend to share with all participants today. Um, a letter of intent, I like to think of a letter of intent as a family love letter. As a caregiver for an individual with a disability, you have forgotten more than anyone will ever know about your loved one. So if you became incapacitated or passed away, do other people know what they need to know um, for success um, for the future of your loved one? And so this letter of intent it is a 20 page form fillable document and it's everything you can think of as it relates to your child. Um, where were they born? What county? What schools have they attended? What are their diagnoses, primary, secondary diagnoses? Who are their medical team? Um, names, address, and phone numbers of medical team. Um, prescriptions. What do they take? And what are they for? Do you have any legal documents in place? What are your religious preferences? It just goes on and on and on. And the, a lot of the things in there, it's just in your head. And you might not communicate that, um, or other people might not know that. And sometimes even the other parent in the household, um, if we have one parent that's a primary caregiver and the other parent's working outside of the home, some of the things as a parent that you do um, with your child, the other parent may not even know the intricate details. So having a letter of intent is going to be an important factor. And I, what I would say is don't sit down and do this all in one sitting. It's a lot. Um, so give yourself some grace and some time to complete it. Think it through. Let somebody know that this letter of intent exists. Maybe you share it with who would be a successor guardian or um, you know who would be in charge of things if you were incapacitated or no longer here on earth. And let somebody know that this document exists. And what we're trying to prevent is somebody having to root through somebody's entire house, the floorboards of the car, you know, underneath the bed, in the safe, the safety deposit box to try to find critical information that would be relative, um, you know, to continuation of care for your loved one with a disability. 
So we suggest that, you know, again, that you work with a special needs planner to help formulate a plan. We suggest that you work with an estate planning attorney who is well versed in special needs matters. I always say don't, you know, your neighbor next door who's the real estate attorney, don't have them create your special needs trust, although they may do it for free, it also very much may be wrong, right? And so you really want to work with a specialist on that. We also want you to gather all the necessary planning documents. And what am I talking about here? I'm talking about statements. What benefits do you have through work, health insurance, disability, long term care? Um, what investments do you have? Stocks, bonds, mutual funds. These are investments that are going to help fund your retirement. You might spend 25 to 35 years in retirement but also may be um, instrumental in funding the special needs trust for your loved one in the future. So it's going to be important to gather all these documents. We want you to think about how your vision, um, what your vision is for how you hope things will look for both you and your loved one. We don't have to be told to look out for our kids because we're always looking out for our kids and their best interests, but oftentimes we do have to be told to be thinking about what you hope your vision for yourself is, because I liken this to the marathon, not the sprints. If you have a loved one that's going to be with you for the rest of your life, they're gonna have care needs for the rest of their life. Um, it's the marathon, not the race. It's a different story than a parent that sends their kid off to college at 18 or 19, and you know they graduate 22, 23, get married and sail off into the sunset. You're, retirement looks a little bit different but what i would say as you're thinking about your vision really be thinking about yourself you're working your whole life and you know paying in and saving up money for your retirement and things like that and your retirement needs to have some semblance of what you want it to be is it travel is it volunteering it can't just all be caregiving services so having said that um april let's take a couple of questions uh, the current question that we have is, how does this work within the high school years? We really want our 16-year-old son in junior year to focus on employment, but school says academic credits are needed. They just have a period of employability where they give very monotonous and bin-based, not employment-focused learning. So April, do you want to um, comment on that? I mean, I my opinion on working or starting work i think a summer earn and learn program is a really good place to start some of our kids have learning disabilities and the credits are a factor and some of the kids are getting failing grades and things like that so to me if your kid is in that boat then maybe a part-time job during the school year might be overload what do you think april that can be overload i would base it based on the student's need, their personality, and of course, where they are academically. And I understand there's also a balance between wanting to focus on the academics if a student doesn't like academia and they just want to be done with school and they want to get a job. I run into that with a lot of students and families that their focus is work because they just want to live through the school process for them. And so I would definitely say uh, get in contact with your local vocational rehabilitation or rehabilitation counselor, because what VR is going to do, they're going to create something called an IPE. I know in special education, we often hear the term IEP, which is an individual education plan, but what vocational rehabilitation does when we say IPE, it's an individual plan for employment. So where one document is specifically looking at academics and school, though it does have a transition process in there where employment does become part of the focus. And the state of Texas is moving to do that at age 14. Now it used to be 16, though many schools would start at 14. Um, we do want to have that individual plan for employment looked at because they're gonna start looking at goals for where the student wants to do after high school and how are they going to do that. And sometimes our counselors can even participate in a 504 or IEP meeting, or at least contribute to the ideas that are going to build on the employment portion of that. So I would say the best bet would be to get in contact with your vocational counselor 
because they are going to be a key proponent of being an advocate to help with those services that are going to lead to employment and to those IEP goals or 504 accommodations that will help with that. And plus, um, once the vocational evaluation has been completed, then they're going to know what the, your students' deficits are and what they may or may not be able to handle and will have a good, um, you know, next steps. That's the whole point of that vocational evaluation. So getting involved with VR and getting moving with those evaluations, I think, is an important step as well. Thank you. So we touched on a letter of intent just a little bit. This is just an example um, of some of the information that goes into a letter of intent. And again, we are going to be providing our letter of intent form fillable template to you so you guys can look at this, but family information, medical history, what kind of government benefits are they getting, living arrangement, just kind of the list goes on and on um, of the things that go into this. And it's just really an important document for somebody to, um, to pick up and to step into your shoes. Just understand as a parent, nobody's ever going to be able to step into your shoes. Um, but you will make the transition a lot smoother with your letter of intent. That is the bottom line with that. And so a letter of intent is also not to replace a will or a trust or any of the other legal documents. It kind of goes alongside of those other documents. Okay. So when we think about um, the future and, you know, thinking about things, a lot of times, a lot of families have not qualified. Their loved one with a disability hasn't qualified for anything. All these years, you've made too much money. They didn't, you know, qualify for SSI. Maybe they qualified for MDCP or a Medicaid waiver program. All states have Medicaid waivers. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but things change. So we want to always make sure that we're preserving the eligibility for state and federally funded programs. SSI is under Title 16. SSDI is under Title 2. We have complete webinars. And, you know, the Social Security Administration is what I call the 10,000 pound gorilla. It's very confusing. There's lots of different programs. And um, some of the programs sound the same, but they're not the same. Some of them don't sound the same, but they are the same. And so there is a lot of confusion with that, but we have complete webinars on that topic. And in fact, I think we did Government Benefits 101 yesterday, so that's a good one to listen to on our YouTube channel. So um, for the kids that didn't qualify for SSI all these years because you made too much money, the magic thing that happens when they turn 18 is that it's based off of their income and assets, not yours. So prior to a child turning 18, SSI is based off of the parent's income and assets, not the child's, but it changes once they turn 18. And this is also, even if the child still lives in your house at 18, even if the individual is under full guardianship, it is based off of the individual's asset and income, not yours at age 18. So a couple of places, you know, you've heard of ABLE accounts, you've heard of special needs trust. These are things that are thrown around in our community. We talk about them all the time. And the reason we talk about them all the time is, you know, most Medicaid guidelines, not all states, I just want to say not all states, all states have Medicaid minimum asset, you know, requirements. Most states the individual cannot have more than $2,000 in their name to qualify for Medicaid. I know that's vastly different in California. Some other states have some other guidelines, but most states, you can't have more than $2,000 in the individual's name outside of a special needs trust or an ABLE account. An ABLE account and a special needs trust are exempt assets, so you could have an unlimited amount of money in a special needs trust for their future care, and you could have up to $100,000 in an ABLE account that would not be counted against them. So if you ask our friend Google about how much money you could have in an ABLE account, I think it's going to tell you 500 or 500,000, something 550, something like that. And the bottom line is, is that is true as long as you don't care about SSI and Medicaid. If you care about SSI and Medicaid, you never want more than $100,000 in that ABLE account. And we'll talk about that in the future. Um, so oftentimes, so people worry, you know, families worry, how am I going to retire and stay retired for 25 to 35 years? 
and still have enough money to fund a special needs trust for 20 to 30 years after I'm gone. And so while it's true, you can be affluent and have plenty of money to fund your retirement and fund the trust, but oftentimes um, people use life insurance with the special needs trust as the beneficiary to fund the special needs trust. They pay for the kids care just as you always have, um, you know, out of current income, even retirement income. And then when you're gone, when the life insurance proceeds pay, they pay to the special needs trust. So having said that, I just want to mention this is probably somewhere else in my slides, but um, I would be remiss to not mention it is important not to name your loved one with a disability directly as a beneficiary on anything you have 401k 403b pension life insurance bank accounts, etc. We don't ever want to name them directly. Because if we name them directly as a beneficiary and you die, then they're going to get the money and it is always more than $2,000, which would throw them out to of kicked out of SSI and Medicaid and could be a Medicaid waiver. So that is a big thing. So if you're taking notes today, again, you're going to get a copy of the slides. Check your beneficiaries. Check your contingent beneficiaries. The proper way to leave money to an individual with a disability is to the special needs trust for the benefit of said child. That is the right way to do it. Um, what I would say is 90% of people have their beneficiaries set up incorrectly. So it's important to look at that. Um, if you've done it, don't beat yourself up about it. It's no big deal. You can request a change of beneficiary form from your employer for any of the employer plans, change of beneficiary from any life insurance contracts you have through the company directly, and you can change your beneficiary free of charge. There's no cost involved with that. So it's an easy thing to fix, but it is important to look at that. Do we have some questions, April? We do. Um... In the state of Texas, can I purchase a $500,000 life insurance policy with my son being an insured and us parents being beneficiary? We will be the owners and beneficiary. We have an SNT and instructions to have our money go into the third party trust on our passing. So that's a great question, and um, and it was loaded for somebody that may have not heard this before. It's very, very important what she said about we would be the owners. So the answer is yes, and we help people with this kind of thing all the time. If the individual, your child, is insurable, the answer is yes. And as long as you are the owner of that policy, then the cash value of that policy will not be counted against the, the individual for state or federally funded programs, namely SSI or Medicaid. However, in that same example, if you were to purchase this policy on your loved one and the loved one is the owner of the policy, then the cash value in that policy would be counted against them and it could cause them to disqualify for said benefits. So underwriting is a concern. Not all individuals with a disability um, are able to qualify for a policy. It depends on the disability. It depends on the severity. It depends on the drugs that they're taking. It depends on their ability to do activities of daily living, feeding oneself, getting out of bed, toiling, transferring, bathing. Those are some examples. And super low IQ um, is tends to be a decline. So if they have, you know, um, an intellectual disability is identified as an IQ of 70 or below. And so 70 would be considered borderline, right? Like as an, for an intellectual disability. But if you have a loved one who has an IQ in the 40s or the 50s, then that may be a decline. But we work with um, all the carriers all across the United States and, and help people find the right program. So that was a great question. Any additional questions, April? We do have one other one. It says um, the letter of intent. They, I believe, are maybe um, mixing that up with the Social Security Administration because they mentioned both together as part of the history packet. Um, and they're a little bit confused about how that works. So the letter of intent, um, the letter of intent has nothing to do um, with Social Security, this is um, this is something that you're going to keep uh, for yourself or share with a successor guardian or successor trustee or executor of your estate. Um, the 
there is a function report. So initially when you apply for SSI, after a little while, you'll get something in the mail, a packet in the mail, and it's called a like a function report. You might get two packets, one for the student to complete, one for your child to complete, one for you to complete. It's okay usually to just complete one. And there's a box on there where you can indicate that you are completing this as a parent for said child. And you can make another note that the child doesn't have the capacity to complete this, or this is true. Um, for for both so you don't have to submit both of those back so if that doesn't answer the question put something else in the um, chat box and we'll we'll clarify that so what do you need to know about applying for SSI the first thing you need to know about applying for SSI is listen to our government benefits 101 on our YouTube channel because it's, it, it is going to go deep and wide into this topic and we're kind of scratching the surface on that today so you want to apply for the SSI the month of your child's birthday appointments should be scheduled a few months in advance for after they turned 18. I have this underlined after they turn 18. It is so important if you have your appointment before they turn 18 it's going to be based off of your income and assets it's going to take a long time for them to make a decision then they're going to come back and tell you no and because you made too much money and you have too much money and and then you're going to have to start the whole process over. Um, so make sure it's after they turn 18. You want to apply through your local office, either by phone or online. This link here on the page is going to take you um, to a page where it will um, allow you to state your intentions of applying. It takes five minutes. And then it says, thank you. We have your request. Someone from our office will call you in a few weeks to schedule your appointment uh, to take the application. So they're going to call you in a few weeks to schedule your appointment. They're not calling for the appointment. Okay. So this will save the date of the application and if approved, it will be backdated to that date. So when thinking about applying for SSI, the first thing that you need to think about is does my child have more than $2,000 in their name? And so you need to be thinking about that. Did grandma and grandpa buy savings bonds 18 years ago that are more than $2,000? So what do we do with that? So first off, what I like to explain to people is there's no such thing as hiding money from the Social Security Administration. Um, I know I'll just close the account. I'll just move the money to my account. So they have a look back. So you don't want to do that. Um, but there are legitimate ways that you can either spend down the money for the um, for the benefit of said child. You could move the excess assets of $2,000 into an ABLE account for the benefit of said child or you could move the excess assets into a special needs trust. Those are all legitimate moves, but just taking the money out, closing the account, you know, maybe the child needs uh, a, a, a wheelchair. Maybe they have, um, maybe there's a home improvement where we're making a medically accessible shower. Those are all legitimate expenses for benefit of said child. So those um, having receipts and proof of spend down on that is good for that. So I always just like to address that. The other thing that I'd like to address is that if your loved one has a 529C, that is not going to be counted against them because they're the beneficiary. Um, you are the owner. The child is not the owner on a 529C and 529Cs can be converted to an A. So um, we wanna have evidence that demonstrates that a child's disability began prior to age 22 to qualify for childhood disability benefits, formerly called DAC, Disabled Adult Child Under a Parent's Record. Um, so basically, initially, most kids are gonna qualify for SSI. There are one-offs where a parent has already um, passed away or a parent is already drawing social security or social security disability. But most of the time, these kids are gonna qualify for SSI first. And then later, when you retire or become disabled, they'll be they'll switch over to childhood disability benefits under a parent's record. Um, but in order to do that, we just have to have proof that their disability started prior to age 22. So if you're sitting on here and you say, well, I have a 26 year old and we haven't even applied, it doesn't matter. You're not too late as long as you have evidence that the disability started prior to age 22. Getting ready for your application, we want you to gather medical history, physician's name, address, phone number, diagnosis history, um, what are the names of the diagnoses, medications, and what they're for. They don't care about the milligrams, but they want to know the names and what the medication is for. If your child has worked, employer information, name, address, and phone number, last um, three uh, uh, pay stubs, last three months of bank statements, if the individual has a bank statement. 
consider chatting with a PCP first, reviewing their records. The Social Security Administration is going to get their medical records. Um, and so there is a Social Security Blue Book, which is basically the medical impairment guide of the guidelines of what they have to prove that an individual has a disability. So you're going to want to look up all of your child's diagnoses in that medical impairment guide, the Social Security Blue Book. Um, and you're going to want to look at the PCP primary care physicians records to see if those records um, really depict what the child's disability is and how the disability affects him or her. So that's going to be really important. Do we have a question, April? We do have a couple. In the state of Texas, can I purchase a $500,000 life insurance policy with my son being insured in us? As oh, parents? I think we already answered that one. We did do that one. I'm sorry. We do have two more, though. The lawyer that created the special needs trust for my daughter recommended not funding the trust at this time due to certain tax implications once the trust is funded. Is there a better or best time to fund a special needs trust? I tend to agree with the attorney on that um, factor. I like our families to keep their assets nimble. You're going to spend 25 to 35 years in retirement. That's a long time. So locking your assets up in a irrevocable trust that you might not be able to get to if you need needed to is probably not a great idea, plus the tax implications that they mentioned. Um, oftentimes what we find is people keep their assets nimble, as I mentioned, and then they fund the special needs trust upon their death. And they may fund it with excess um, assets that they did not use during their lifetime. And they also may fund it with um, proceeds from the life insurance that is payable to the special needs trust, where the beneficiary is the special needs trust. Okay, and then the next one is, can we create a special needs trust or ABLE account at any age for our child? So a special needs trust, um, there are some limits if the special needs trust is not created prior to age 65. So there's, it starts getting dicey on there if it's not created prior to age 65. An ABLE account can be established at any time as long as the disability began prior to 20, age 26. And in 2026, that age is going up to 46. So if the disability started prior to age 46 in 2026, you can establish an ABLE account, but you can do it at any time. You can do it prior to them turning 18. You could do it after they turn 18. And it, and, um, and it just depends on when the disability started. Okay, and then the next question is, do these trust or ABLE accounts have anything to do with guardianship or is that a totally different process? Unfortunately, and that is, thank you, this is like my my bailiwick here, like everything is a totally separate process, everything, except, you know, the, the letter of intent applying for SSI, the special needs trust, the ABLE account, guardianship, these are all separate processes, and that's why I said that as a parent, it feels pretty overwhelming, like all these things I need to know that I didn't need to know. You know, some people say, well, do I need guardianship now? I don't have guardianship. I didn't know I need a guardianship. Well, you don't need guardianship prior to age uh, 18. You are their guardian. And they're in, <clears throat> in Texas, the law is least restrictive and most appropriate for the ward. Um, or the individual is what is um, what the law looks at as least restrictive and most appropriate. Most states have similar um, similar viewpoints on guardianship. Some states call guardianship conservatorship, um, and so we have um, in Texas we have um, full guardianship, partial guardianship. Um, there's also something called supported decision making agreement that usually goes alongside a power of attorney and a healthcare power of attorney. And the thing is, is what I want to tell you, I just want to encourage you not to be nervous. Um, the attorneys that are nuanced and special needs um, are equipped to talk to you about this, to talk you through it, to educate you on it and um, kind of you know, guide you in the right direction of what might be the best fit for your loved one. You don't have to go knowing, go in knowing exactly what you need and that kind of thing. They're going to help you with that. We've got lots of um, webinars on special needs trust, first party and third party special needs trust. Lots of webinars on guardianship and alternatives to guardianship um, on our YouTube channel. So you'll want to check those out. Um, are we okay on questions for now? 
We are. And I did put your YouTube channel in the chat for people. Okay, thank you. All right, so what should you expect after you apply? Um, decisions usually take up to one year in Texas, okay? Other states are much faster. Texas is very, very behind. We are understaffed, underpaid, overworked, all of that when it comes to the Social Security Administration. And, and things are moving pretty slow right now, unfortunately. Um, other states are moving faster. So, um, so this is not something that when you're thinking about SSI and 943 a month that you submit your application and you think in a month or two, you're going to just start magically getting 943 a month. It is slow. You should not count on that happening anytime soon. After your local office has finalized your application, it's sent to Disability Determination Services. And in Texas, it's going to be sent to Austin. Most states, it's going to be sent to your capital um, for Disability Determination Services. They're going to be sending out medical record requests to your physicians. Um, they'll be looking at those medical records for evidence of a disability. The phone number that we have on the screen here, this 800-252-7009, this is Disability Determination Services in Texas, where you can call. They actually do answer the phone here um, and will advise who your caseworker is and will tell you where they are in your application process. If you call this number, if you've completed your application, and you call this number, they're going to say one of three things. Yes, we have the application that's waiting to be assigned to a caseworker. My kid's case took nine months to get assigned. That's how behind they are. Okay, so it was sitting at DDS for nine months before anything happened. Um, or they'll say, yes, we have it. And it has been assigned to the caseworker and the caseworker's extension number is XYZ. Or no, we don't have it. If they say no, we don't have it, then that tells you that you need to um, reach back out to the local Social Security Administration to find out why they have not submitted the application. If DDS does not have the application, exactly nothing is happening on your application. So it's even further behind than the timeline that I gave you, okay? So that's that. So talking about Social Security and drawing from a parent's record, um, so this is some kind, sometimes called DAC, Disabled Adult Child, sometimes called CDB, sometimes it's called SSDI under a parent's record, and sometimes for your confusion, it's called RSDI under a parent's record. So those are all terms that are synonymous, but it basically, when a parent applies to receive their own Social Security benefits through retirement or disability, the disabled adult child is re um, entitled to receive one half of the parent's benefits. So in the example that a parent's benefit is $4,000 a month, the said child would be eligible for $2,000 a month. They would switch over from SSI to these childhood disability benefits. And this would continue as long as the child remains disabled and as long as the parent rem remains alive. If the parent passes away, the disabled adult child is entitled to 75% of the deceased parent's social security. Um, the benefit amount is based off of the parent's full retirement age benefit. So, and the, what I mean by that is every year, we delay turning on our Social Security past our full retirement age, which for a lot of us is 67, some of it's 66 in a few months. Um, our Social Security benefit is increasing 8% a year. Every year we delay up until age 70. But the Disabled Adult Child Benefits, or CDB, is based off of your full retirement age, so if that's 67. There is a such thing as family maximum, so the calculation isn't always perfect. If we have more than one child with a disability in the household, more than one person drawing off of a parent's record. So um, one thing that I will say is we, because we're nationally certified as social security advisors, we do have the only software out there that takes into consideration the disabled adult child. And what this software does is an analysis of all of your working years and what you've paid into the social security, what your spouse has paid into the social security if there's a spouse. And this tells us exactly when and how to pull the trigger on your Social Security to maximize benefits for the whole household. This is critically imp important because if you look, you'll find online that about 80% of people um, that have turned on their Social Security have are not maximized. They didn't know. They weren't guided. Um, oh, did you know if you wait three more months that it'll actually be $300 more a month? Like, So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of money left on the table by not um, not, you know, maximizing um, how you're claiming these benefits. We do have one more question if you would like to take it now. Sure. 
If it takes over nine months before they review, will the child still be able to get medical coverage? Well, as they're doing the review, they're reviewing Medicaid too. So you can apply for Medicaid separately. Um, and, and for Texas, it's your Texas benefits. All states have a Medicaid portal where you can apply for Medicaid separately and hopefully get Medicaid in the meantime. Medicaid applications right now in Texas are taking 60 to 90 days. It's very slow. I think that they have 60 days once they receive it to even look at it. So it is a slow process. So the answer is no, as far as the Medicaid that comes along with SSI, unfortunately. And what my hope is, is that if your child is covered by group insurance under the family's you know, policy through one of the parents' employers, keep them on that. You can keep your kids on your group benefits past age 18 and up, um, up to age 26 if they're not disabled. But if they are disabled, you can ask your employer for the form uh, to keep your kids on group benefits past age 26 um, because they were disabled prior to that time. That is a thing and you absolutely can do that. But often um, times people don't know that that is um, an available option. We okay on questions? We are. Oh, okay, wait, perfect. one more just came in. I'm sorry. Are ABLE accounts and special needs trusts state-based? If we create them in Texas and move after a few years, how does that impact it? So ABLE accounts, you can have an ABLE account from any state. It absolutely doesn't matter. You don't need to change it. Special needs trust. Um, if you create a trust in one state and then move to another state, um, it probably does not need to be redone, but just because state laws could be different, I would have it evaluated in the new state, but it doesn't need to be redone. What does need to be redone is guardianship. In fact, in Texas, even if you move counties, you've got to update the counties if you move counties. So if you have guardianship in the state of Texas, for instance, and you move to Florida, that guardianship is not good in Florida. So you're going to have to work with an attorney in Florida on, for, for guardianship or conservative, conservatorship in that new state. And then you have another one. My daughter currently receives survivor benefits from her father's passing. I was told those benefits would automatically roll over to SSDI when she turns 18. So do I still need to call and make an appointment with Social Security when she turns 18? There's nothing automatic. What is automatic is when she turns 18, they're going to send a letter saying that they're going to cut her benefits off because if she's receiving survivor benefits because a parent died, it has nothing to do with it, that she's disabled. All kids would re receive a, a survivor benefit even if they're not disabled. So you'll, <clears throat> you'll get a letter saying that she's going to get cut off unless she's a full-time student and there's a form to prove that she's still a full-time student, which will continue benefits to age 19, you will need to apply to continue survivor benefits post age 18 on the premise that she is a disabled adult child under a parent's record. It is not automatic and she will have to go through the approval process of proving that she is disabled. But as long as she's still a full-time student to age 19 and you submit the pro proper paperwork, they will continue the benefits to age 19, which may prevent a gap of waiting for that approval. Okay, great question. You have a couple more that just came in. Would you like those now? Sure. And all the service lawyers, counselors that help create Anvil accounts and guide family through the paid process, is this correct? Do you want me to reread that one? Yes, please. And all the services and lawyers and counselors that help create ABLE accounts and guide families through the process are pay paid, right? Like I'm, I think they're asking if each person in the process is paid separately. Yeah, the attorneys don't do what we do. We don't do what they do. So yes, that, that would be the case. The attorneys don't create ABLE accounts. We create the ABLE accounts. We don't create a special needs trust or a guardianship, but we um, help people get the life insurance that's going to fund the special needs trust. And we name the special needs trust as the beneficiary for the life insurance. Um, there are programs for the indigent Disability Rights Texas, all states have legal services for the indigent. 
So if you need help with guardianship or a special needs trust um, and you have, um, you know, sh you're short on funds or there's other extenuating circumstances, you can look to those programs as well. Okay, and uh, let's see, this one looks like a comment. Um, the parent says, my daughter is receiving SSI. Um, be careful how you answer questions during the application process. My lack of knowledge resulted in her not getting the maximum every month. I had to create a lease agreement and show SS that I was no longer paying her living expenses. Would you like to comment on that? So that is true, um, but most of the time they won't um, accept a rent agreement on application. They'll accept the rent agreement um, once it is approved. Some states are different. Some counselors are different on what they'll accept and not accept. But in general, um, if your you know, loved one is has a rent agreement in place and they'll say, well, how are they paying rent if they don't have any money? and you say, well, the rent is owed based off of age 18, and once um, the SSI is approved and we get the back pay, then the back rent will be paid. So that's one way to go about doing it. But if there's not a rent agreement, then the SSI will be reduced by one third. Instead of 943, you'll get about 629 per month. So we got just a few minutes left, so I'm gonna keep going. We talked about the special needs um, trust being the beneficiary and not the named individual. It is important to make sure that you have um, um, intentional conversations with any aging family members, parents uh, that may be affluent that would want to leave money to their special needs love, loved one, grandson, granddaughter. Um, their advisor is probably not nuanced in special needs. So when they go in and say, I have this grandson that I love, they say, great, what is his name? And that's how quick the beneficiary gets changed to your child's name and not the special needs trust. So making sure that you've got money in the right buckets is going to be important, making sure that those special needs trusts are set up, making sure that we um, that we have an able account, um, you know, set up to where we don't have more than $2,000 in the individual's um, name is going to be important. So the special needs trust is going to preserve future benefit eligibility while providing resources. Um, the guardianship process can um, can begin six months prior to the child turning 18. So you're gonna to wanna to work with a qualified attorney on this. So six months prior, so that way the guardianship can go in place once they do turn 18, which will be helpful. There is a such thing as a educational power of attorney. So if the child has capacity to understand what they're signing and a power of attorney, um, healthcare power of attorney supported decision-making agreement is um, appropriate, you can also do an educational power of attorney as well. So in talking about an ABLE account, um, we have entire presentations on an ABLE account. Uh, an ABLE account, the beneficiary is the account owner. It does not jeopardize SSI, Medicaid, or other public benefits, but there are special contribution limits. So um, an ABLE account, if it can be construed as achieving a better life for an individual with a an, um, disability, you can pay for it out of an ABLE account. You can pay for food and shelter out of an ABLE account. Um, fin financial management services, legal services, transportation, education, assistive technology, personal support services or attendant services, um, all can be paid out of an ABLE account. You can even pay for a vacation for the individual and one to two caregivers. And I always say don't get crazy that you can't take the whole family on vacation um, from the ABLE account, but you can, um, You that that is a possibility. So. Um, the rules on the ABLE account um, is subject to the gift tax exclusion, $18,000 a year. That goes up each year. If the individual is working, you can have an additional um, $14,580 that can go into the ABLE account. There's tax-free growth uh, of the investments um, and um, tax-free distributions as long as it can be construed as achieving a better life for an individual with a disability. This is not a Roth, but it kind of acts like a Roth, okay, is how it acts. It's a cool account. But there is a Medicaid payback on a ABLE account. So if the individual is getting Medicaid, there could be a Medicaid payback at their death. Um, there's a special calculation that they'll do and any remaining account balances would go to the individual with a disabilities estate. And this is just a list of things that a special needs trust can pay for. The main thing that a special needs trust um, should not pay for 
um, is food and shelter if you do not want a reduction to the SSI. A special needs trust can pay for food and shelter, but if you're paying for monthly debt service, food and shelter, there would be a one third reduction to SSI. Some people don't care about that, but that's why an ABLE account and a special needs trust um, work well together. And we've kind of already hit on this on what not to pay for out of the special needs trust, okay? So, um, so thinking about who's gonna care for your child when you're gone, developing a future care plan now is gonna answer these questions. We want to consider educational and vocational options post high school. Are we going to work? Are we going to school? Are we going to trade school? Are we going to get a license or a certificate? We suggest considering um, touring transition programs, partial care, full care, residential communities. Waiting lists can be um, very, very long, so you're going to want to look at that. I mentioned earlier the Medicaid waivers. Um, we have entire presentations on our YouTube channel regarding Medicaid waivers. Um, this slide here is going to be how to get on the Medicaid waiver interest list in Texas. Unfortunately, in Texas, we have a 17 year waiting list for services. So if your child is not on this, you're going to want to get on the list soon. There's MDCP, class, deafblind, multiple disability, HCS, Texas Home Living, Community First Choice, Star Plus. Uh, this link is to learn who your local authority is and how to get on those waivers. And our next slide here just talks about some of the waivers in Texas. And for our listeners that are listening from out of state, all states have Medicaid waivers. Medicaid waivers are designed, designed to waive off some of the cost of care for caring for an individual with a disability to keep them in home and community-based services. They may pay for various therapies, attendant services, respite services, et cetera. So they are good once you get one, but it takes a long time to get them here. In other states, some states don't have any waiting list at all. So it is important if you're from another state to be checking this out. We talked about a lot of things today and on our YouTube channel, we go deep and wide on any of these topics. If you want to learn more about special needs trust, ABLE accounts, guardianship, Medicaid waivers, um, applying for SSI or government benefits, we've got entire webinars um, dedicated to those topics. So you're going to get a copy of today's slides. It's going to have a link to our upcoming webinars, and you can subscribe to any of the topics that are upcoming that might be relevant to your journey and the stuff that you're on. We work on a collaborative team here at CPG. Um, I am the owner of CPG. We have an awesome team. So if we choose to uh, work together in the future, uh, you'll get me. Well, you'll also get other members of our team. I always like to share um, faces with names on that as well. We always offer free personalized consultations. So if you had questions today that um, didn't get answered um, or you want to take the next step, what I would tell you is it's not about looking at back. It's not about beating yourself up about what you haven't done or that you got started and you put it on the shelf. Maybe you've done a lot of planning. We got a lot of people that we work with that have done a lot of planning, but you need a second opinion because maybe your advisor isn't nuanced in special needs. We're here to help. So this QR code um, will take you to our calendar where you can schedule your free personalized consultation. It has certainly been my pleasure. Um, we went just a teeny bit over today. Um, my pleasure being with you here today. We're out of time for questions, but if you have additional questions, just reach out. We're happy to answer them. In April, it was certainly my pleasure to be back with you again, and we'll look forward to being back with you on October 2nd. Sounds great. Thanks. Thanks so much, everyone. Have an awesome afternoon. Take care.